Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about energy resources. Topic for the day is going to be electricity and fossil fuels. And before I even jump in, I'm going to tell you, just go ahead and grab a snack, a drink, make sure that you're comfortable. This one's probably going to take a little bit. We've got some stuff to cover. So like always, let me get you some objectives. Here's the things that I need you to know or be able to do by the end of this video. First one, describe the process of electricity generation, and the second is to compare and contrast the major fossil fuels according to their individual advantages and disadvantages. So that's what we've got. Let's go ahead and jump on in. First thing, let's talk about electricity. A couple things you need to know. Electricity is known as a secondary energy source, and the reason that it's called a secondary energy source is because you use other energy sources in order to create it. So you burn coal in order to create electricity. You burn natural gas in order to create electricity. You run a wind turbine in order to create uh, electricity. So you are using one form of energy to create another form of energy. So that's why it's known as a secondary energy source. It's also known as an energy carrier because it carries energy from one place to another, usually via transmission lines. Now let's go ahead and just jump on in to the process of generating electricity. It's a very simple process and it's pretty much the same regardless of what fuel you are using. Um, there are some variations when we talk about solar power, but for the most part, this is how you make electricity. And this is specifically for using coal, but here's basically how it works. So in almost every electricity generation plant, you're gonna have some sort of boiler and you're gonna use your fuel. In this case, we are using coal. This could be oil, it could be natural gas, but you're using a fuel and you are burning that fuel in order to heat water, okay? As you heat that water, the water boils and it gives off steam. This steam is used to turn a turbine. This thing right here is a turbine. A turbine is like a big old fan. As that turbine spins, it turns a generator, this right here would be a generator, and the generator is the thing that actually creates the electricity. So steam turns the turbine, turbine turns the generator, the generator creates electricity, and then that electricity goes out to the power grid and is carried along the transmission lines. Usually the steam that is used to turn the turbine is condensed back into water and recycled through the process all over again. So this is the basic process you could use. This could be using nuclear fuel to boil the water. It could be using oil. It could be using natural gas. But basically you are turning a turbine to turn a generator to create electricity. Now there are some plants called combined cycle plants. And combined cycle plants are plants that actually increase the efficiency by using two different processes to make electricity. In this case we are using natural gas and we got a couple things going on. So you got your natural gas coming into the combustion chamber. It is being combusted or burned. <clears throat> Excuse me. That vapor from the burning of the gas is being used to spin one turbine, which is spinning one generator. Then that exhaust gas, which has just been used to turn the turbine, is super hot, so it is used to boil water, and that creates steam, which turns a second steam turbine, which turns a second generator. So you're using the vapor from the gas combustion to spin one turbine, and then you're using the heat off that gas to boil water to turn a second turbine. So this is known as combined cycle plants, and it increases your efficiency, obviously, because you're using one fuel source, but you're using it to generate electricity in two different ways. Sorry for that edit in there, my computer got all weird. Next thing you need to know about electricity generation is the idea of capacity. Now, the capacity is basically how much electricity a power plant can produce. Generally, power plants are measured in megawatts. And if you remember way back, a watt is basically how much electricity is being put out, just sheer capacity that's being shot out of the plant. So power plants are measured in megawatts. A typical power plant is somewhere around 500 megawatts. If you let that power plant run for one hour, it will generate 500 megawatt hours of electricity. So if you take a megawatt, you generate a megawatt of electricity for one hour, you have generated a megawatt hour of power. And if we we're talking about the home energy bill, that's gonna be measured in kilowatt hours. So you get a thousand kilowatt hours in a megawatt hour. And if you look at your bill, like for your electricity every month, you'll notice that it is uh, listed in KWH. So I just want you to be Aware of those units, 
<clears throat> and know that the capacity factor is the percentage of the time that a power plant is actually running. Now, power plants are costly things to run. If a power company can get away with it, let's say a power company has got multiple power plants in their portfolio, if they can get away with it, they're not going to run all of them all of the time because, you know, that's a costly thing to do. So a capacity factor is basically the percentage of time that a power plant is up and running and producing electricity. And it's going to vary drastically by plant and by power company. Some power plants are really hard to get up and get going. So the power company just leaves them running all the time. They might have like a 90% capacity factor because they do need to be shut down sometimes for cleaning and maintenance or whatever. Other uh, power sources like, let's say, I don't know, solar energy would have a capacity factor of like 50% because the sun's only shining half the time. So another capacity factor is the amount of time that a power plant is actually making electricity. Just like we talked about um, co, what is it called, combined cycle plants, you need to know about cogeneration too. And cogeneration is another scenario where you are getting two things out of one type of fuel. In the case of cogeneration, you are getting electricity and heat. So in this case, you have got your um, water being boiled. That steam is then going to turn the turbine. And then once the steam leaves the turbine, it's piped through plants or through pipes throughout whatever plant that generator is in. And the uh, piping through the plant actually helps to heat up that plant. So you're getting out electricity. You're also getting heat that can be used to warm a building. So that would be known as cogeneration. And let's finally go ahead and just jump on into fossil fuels. Now, fossil fuels are the world's choice for energy. They are readily accessible. We know how to use them. We know how to transport them. And we know how to get electricity out of them. So for that reason, they are the choice of the world. Now, the problem with fossil fuels is that they are a finite resource. Once they are gone, they are gone. They are not something that we can just keep using over and over and over and over again. They will run out eventually. And the rest of this video is going to be going through the major types of fossil fuels and talking about the relative advantages and disadvantages of each one. First fossil fuel that I want you to know about is coal. And you should probably be fairly aware of the process that is used to form coal and also know that this process is transferable to oil with slight modifications and I'll tell you, tell you about those modifications in just a second. But as far as coal formation goes, here are the major points. Coal starts out as, geez, forgive that straight mark, um, coal starts out as plants in a tropical swampy area. So these plants in the tropical swampy area eventually die and as they die they fall into the swamp and they are put into anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic means there's no air around. So they do not decompose that well because the organisms that would normally break them down are not present in that anaerobic environment. So over time, they're going to build up in the bottom of the swamp. As layer builds upon layer builds upon layer, the pressure of the layers on top press down, causing this material to form into peat. Peat is a very soft form of coal. Actually, it's not even known as coal, but it's a soft organic material that can be burned. Um, it's used throughout Europe as a heat source. Over time, our swamp dries up, new land starts to form on top of our peat, and that presses down on top of that material. As the peat is pressed over time, um, impurities are pressed out of it. The carbon molecules or the carbon atoms are forced closer together. It becomes purified and it turns into a form of coal known as lignite. Now there are three grades of coal. Each one is more efficient and burns cleaner than the last and each one has been subjected to more pressure and heat and time. So lignite is the lowest grade of coal. It releases the least energy. It is also the dirtiest burning. Now take our lignite, continue to subject it to pressure and heat over time and it will become bituminous coal and this is our middle grade coal. It is middle of the road polluting. It reduces a middle of the road, or it produces a middle of the road amount of energy. Take that bituminous coal, keep pressing it over time, and finally you get to anthracite. Anthracite is like the coal. That is the one that people want because it is most energy dense. When you burn it, it gives up the most uh, heat that can be used to produce electricity. It also burns the cleanest. Now note, it's still coal, so it burns dirty, but it burns way cleaner than lignite or peat or anything like that. So just know swamp plants pressed over time gives you different grades of coal. 
Now, talking about coal, it is the world's choice for energy. In terms of electricity generation, it is the fuel that is used most frequently to make electricity. Um, the major countries that utilize coal are the U.S., Russia, China, and India. Those are the world's biggest coal producers. The U.S. has tremendous coal reserves, as does Russia and China. So know those as far as places go. You might get some questions about, like, which countries are big coal producers. So be aware of those. Disadvantages of coal and advantages of coal. We're going to start out with the advantages. So things that people like about coal, one is that it's plentiful. There is a lot of coal around the world and that it's easy to get to. Most coal deposits are fairly close to surface years. Just start digging down, you find that coal, you can pull it out. You don't really need to process it. There's not really any processing. Once you pull it out of the ground, you can take it to a plant and you can burn it. So because it's easy to use and plentiful, it is cheap. Uh, it's energy dense and it's easy to transport. You can put it in a truck, a boat, a train, whatever, and move it from one place to the other. Now, the disadvantages of coal, major ones that you need to know. Burning coal is a dirty process. It releases particulate pollution. It also releases a lot of sulfur, mercury, and lead into the atmosphere. And once those things are into the atmosphere, they can get into waterways. People can breathe them in. We know that mercury and lead are neurotoxins. Sulfur contributes to smog formation. So it is a big polluting fuel. Also, after you burn it, there is ash that is left over. That ash that is left over needs to be dealt with, whether it is used to create other materials, whether it is put into a landfill, whatever, there's ash left over that has to be dealt with. And it releases the most carbon dioxide per unit burned. Our next fossil fuel that I want to talk a little bit about is going to be petroleum. Now, petroleum is the big one. Petroleum is oil. As far as formation goes, um, it's kind of the same process as coal in that it takes pressure and time. It's just the location and the material is a little different. So with uh, coal, we pressed swamp plants. With oil, we've got ocean-dwelling plankton, which are little single-cell photosynthetic organisms living in the ocean. As they photosynthesize, they create carbohydrates, trapping the sun's energy. When they die and sink down to the bottom of the ocean, they hold on to those carbohydrates that build up on the bottom of the ocean over time. Sediment builds up on top of them. They get pressed together, and just like coal, more pressure, more time, kind of purifies and, I guess, concentrates the substance. Over time, it will turn into petroleum. <clears throat> Generally, petroleum is found in porous rock, like sandstone, where it can hang out in the pores within that rock. Petroleum does require refine, refinement, which means that you can take that crude oil that you pull up out of the ground and you can heat it up and boil it and cause it to change into or pull away from it different materials. Um, it's the raw material for many projects. It's found in plastic. Obviously, it's used in your engine. It runs your car. It's used as an industrial lubricant. So people have found lots and lots of ways to use petroleum. As soon as my computer will get there, we will talk about the advantages of petroleum. So here's the thing you need to know. It's a mobile fuel. You can put it into a gas tank and drive around with it. You can't do that with coal, really, and it's difficult to do with natural gas. So you can refine it into gasoline or diesel, put that into a gas tank, and you can go. It is very energy dense, which means that you get a lot of energy per unit burned. And as far as burning it goes, it burns more cleanly than coal, which means it releases less pollution and less carbon dioxide. As far as the disadvantages go, you got carbon emissions. Um, the biggest CO2 emitters in the world are from uh, transportation, so that would be the burning of petroleum in the form of gas. And then you got the big ones, oil spills. Um, you need to know Deepwater Horizon, Gulf of Mexico, 2010, and then you need to know the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska in, I believe it was 1989, though that may not be quite correct. So oil spills are a big deal. Also, runoff from land. As people's cars drive across the road, as they sit in parking lots, they drip oil. When it rains, that oil washes off the road into waterways. Um, it's said that 85% of oil pollution actually runs off of the land and is not the result of big-scale oil spills that we hear about all the time. Also, it's controversial as far as, you know, should we be burning it? Should we not be burning it? Should we be drilling in wildlife refuges in the Gulf of Mexico to extract oil? Should we be exploiting sensitive habitat to get to oil? So it is you know, that classic environmental science controversy between those who want to protect the environment and those who want to promote the uh, mode of life that we have become accustomed to. Last major fossil fuel that you need to know about is natural gas. Now, natural gas is found with petroleum, and basically what you get is a situation like this. You have got your sandstone, which would be the porous rock that oil hangs out in. There's usually shale caprock, which is an impermeable 
impermeable rock over the top. So the oil, which is less dense than the rock, migrates up to the top. And then out of the oil migrates natural gas, which is methane. And that natural gas hangs out on the top of the oil. And now for a long time, oil drilling operations saw natural gas purely as a nuisance. They would suck it off and just burn it um, as a flare off the top of the oil rig so that they could get to the oil. People have since learned how to use natural gas effectively, so it's no longer a waste product. It's actually used as a fuel. Um, it's used for heating, it's used for cooking, it's used for electricity generation. There are some outfits that are working on using it as a fuel in uh, transportation vehicles, so it's a fairly useful and versatile fuel that people like quite a bit. As far as the advantages go, it's abundant. There is a lot of natural gas around the world, particularly in America. Of the three, petroleum, coal, and natural gas. Natural gas burns the cleanest, so it gives off the least pollution. It's also very energy dense. Now, as is the case with all fossil fuels, we've got some disadvantages you need to know about. Now, in natural gas itself, methane is a very, very potent greenhouse gas. So on its own, when it's released into the environment, it increases the process of global warming. Also, burning it gives off CO2. And then you need to know about fracking. Fracking is a highly controversial method of retrieving natural gas that is, I mean, in America, it's one that we are fighting about almost continually. So you need to know a little bit about the process of fracking. Basically, here's how it works. So we said that natural gas is down in the shale rock. It is kind of trapped. And what you're going to do if you are fracking is you're going to drill wells. And this well is going to go way down deep into the crust of the earth. Once you got that well drilled, you're going to force a slurry of chemicals, water, and sand down into this rock. And you're going to force it down there under extremely high pressure. Now, the point of forcing that water down there under high pressure is that it causes the shale to fracture. When the shale fractures, it releases natural gas. That natural gas bubbles back up through your fluid. It can be collected, and you have just extracted natural gas. Now, here are the controversies around fracking. Um, first thing is that fracking liquid. Companies are not required to release what is in that liquid that is being forced down into the earth. Um, conjecture has been made about there being benzene and other carcinogens in it. But either way, there is this mystery fluid that is being forced down into the earth under high pressure. They say they are recovering all of it, but inevitably you're not going to be able to get everything back. Um, there has also been significant problems with groundwater contamination, where as this methane comes back up through the pipeline, it can end up in groundwater supplies. And once it is in the groundwater supply, you know, you've got contaminated groundwater. So that contaminated groundwater, you can find all kinds of videos online of people lighting their, their uh, tap water on fire because it's got so much methane in it. So that is natural gas. Make sure that you're aware of that process of fracking. It appears that my uh, pin has decided to get stuck on. So you got a little art there on the picture of tar sands. Final type of fossil fuel you need to know about is tar sands and coal to a liquid. Tar sands are basically sand that has got a low grade of oil known as tar mixed in with it. Um, you can just dig it up off of the surface of the land, but it takes significant processing in order to use this. Obviously, you got to extract the sand out, then you got to take that tar and process it into usable oil. So there's a lot of tar sand in Canada, and there has been a lot of push to build pipelines, notably the Keystone XL pipeline that makes those tar sands available for use in America. But it's highly controversial because you can see there, mining tar sands does tremendous damage to the land. Also, it's a very energy intensive source of fuel to mine because once you mine it, you got to refine it, you got to take the sand out. So it takes a lot of work to make it usable. And then there's coal to liquid, which is a technology that takes coal it pulverizes it and actually through a pretty complex process turns it into liquid that can be burned almost like gasoline. Problem with the coal to liquid process is that it is very energy intensive. So sometimes you can spend more energy make, turning coal to liquid than you actually get out at the end. So the energy return on energy invested is not good for coal to liquid. And that's it. Forgive the edits, the length of the video, the art on the page, all of the difficulties we've had. Either way, I hope you found this tutorial useful. My name is Mr. Kite. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. Hopefully we'll see you again.